Hey guys, how's it going? Roger says hey. So, I'm gonna be honest, in light of all of the news happening over the past 24 hours, Afghanistan has been on my mind a lot. I really got curious about it yesterday and literally spent several hours kind of not only just learning about what was going on, but kind of also researching the whole situation over there. Geopolitical stuff really does interest me and I kind of hesitated doing this video because I don't really like getting into politics a lot on my channel because it usually just invites a Bunch of arguing and personal attacks down in the comments and if I say something that somebody doesn't agree with and they start attacking me down in the comments and I just like having a more positive vibe on my channel so I feel like this is a bit of a gamble to do this video but I'm going to instead of getting into the politics of the current situation I really wanted to watch it because I want to learn more about the history of the situation I'm learning more and more and more as I do more history content on my channel that is really really hard to understand the current circumstances we are in without understanding what came before. History always provides a lot of context for the present. Now in my research yesterday I did learn a little bit but I am still largely very ignorant about the past in that part of the world. Now I know that Britain and Russia also tried to go into Afghanistan. I don't really know what they were doing there but I know before the U.S. went in 20 years ago Britain and Russia were there before and they apparently had a hard time as well just like the U.S. has had a hard time there. And I saw some people referring to Afghanistan as like the graveyard of empires. It just seems to me like it's a really really hard region of the world to go in and try and control. And this seems to be because it's very tribal, there's no real national identity even though I think it was Britain that kind of created the country of Afghanistan or at least the current borders of it. From what I've gathered the West has really tried to kind of hoist a national identity on the people living there but they don't really subscribe to that. So there's a very real disconnect that's happening that's kind of led to what's going on today there. So I just want to reiterate that my purpose of this video is not to criticize the United States or the current situation or the British or the Russians. Again, this is just me trying to get more of an academic understanding of that region of the world. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that you guys will down in the comments be respectful of that. We're going to go ahead and check out why is pretty much impossible to conquer Afghanistan. Looking forward to learning more, I guess, about the geographical and political and maybe religious, social aspects of this part of the world. So let's go ahead and get into it. In 2001, the United States military invaded Afghanistan. 20 years later, the U.S. is withdrawing and the Taliban appears to be stronger than ever, with control of up to 85% of the country. In 1979, the Soviet Union also invaded Afghanistan and after nine years, they also withdrew and the regime they fought so hard to prop up almost immediately collapsed. And before them, the British Empire invaded Afghanistan on three separate occasions and failed to conquer them three, in each huh? instance. Today, wow. Afghanistan has a smaller population than California in a territory that's only a little larger than France. So how is it that a country of this small size was capable of resisting three of the world's most powerful military juggernauts from history? There's a lot of answers to that question, but let's start with the easiest to understand and perhaps the most obvious, geography. In reality, Afghanistan is little more than a geographical expression. All of her borders were arbitrarily drawn up by outside foreign powers more than a century ago. Its small population is composed of a loose association of 14 different ethno-linguistic groups and numerous more tribes, many of which, like the Uzbeks, Tajiks, and Pashtuns, straddle the country's borders. Artificial boundaries set up by Westerners hundreds of years ago that mean very little to them. The Pashtuns make up nearly half of Afghanistan's population today, but two-thirds of all Pashtuns live next door in neighboring Pakistan and are a minority group there. The border between Afghanistan and Pakistan runs directly through the Pashtun tribal area and divides the 60 million Pashtun people between both countries. This boundary That's was artificially good. decided by the British Empire back in 1893, and to date, not a single government based in Afghanistan has ever officially ratified it. Imagine if in Europe, Poland was divided between Germany and Russia, and a wall was built directly between both sides of where the Poles live. Obviously, the Poles would never recognize this border and routinely cross it to visit family and friends. 
and the Pashtuns largely treat the Afghan-Pakistan border the very same way. The border here is extremely mountainous and rural, so patrolling it from the Pakistani government's perspective has always been quite challenging. This has allowed Pashtun insurgents operating within Afghanistan the valuable ability to easily escape across the border into the friendly Pashtun areas of Pakistan, regroup and recover, recruit more men, and then travel back into Afghanistan freshly mm. supplied and ready for more combat. Neither the Afghan okay. border nor the Taliban recognize this border as legitimate, and there are at least 235 known crossing points across the border and through the mountains between both countries. Militants, <laughs> drugs, money, and supplies. You know yeah, 250 border crossings are not going to be defended. <laughs> That's almost impossible. It's also interesting this uh, sign is in English to me. Now, I know English is spoken in a lot of areas, but um, that's... I wouldn't have expected it, actually, so that's interesting to me. ...and through the mountains between both countries. Militants, drugs, money, and supplies can easily be smuggled into Afghanistan by way of Pakistan, and it's made all the easier by many of the Pashtuns of Pakistan being more sympathetic to the Afghan or Taliban cause. This has led many people to... You know what? These uh, mountains, that looks like California. <laughs> it really does look like California, and the other uh, pictures they were showing, too... It's amazing like how similar it is. And being more sympathetic to the Afghan or Taliban cause. This has led many people to label the Afghan-Pakistan border as the most dangerous border in the entire world. And recently, as a result of all of this, by the end of June 2021, Pakistan has finally finished building a fence across the entire length of the border, specifically to stop all of this and has restricted border wow. crossings to only 16 legally designated locations. Even but in the this is areas? all only the start of what makes Afghanistan an almost impossible place to conquer. I mean, just look at the map. Afghanistan is landlocked, so getting your troops and supplies there requires the cooperation of at least one of the six countries that borders it. Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, China, and of course, Pakistan. But even once you get across one of these countries and you arrive at Afghanistan's borders, you're going to be met with Afghanistan's monumentally challenging terrain. Despite being in the center of the world's most populous continent, Afghanistan has always been heavily isolated and largely rural and underpopulated because of this. The high peaks of the Hindu Kush mountain range with some of the tallest and biggest mountains found anywhere on the planet. 75% really? of Afghanistan's territory is considered to be mountainous, and nearly half of our territory has an elevation above 2,000 meters which makes Afghanistan among the most mountainous countries of the world, and among the most isolated huh. too as a result. These huge mountains act like natural walls in more ways than one. They help to keep invaders out, but they also separate communities within and make transporting supplies across challenging. These are all very difficult factors to overcome from the perspective of any outside invader. There are dozens of valleys that zigzag in between the mountains of Afghanistan where most of the population resides. And since they're surrounded by some of the biggest and most formidable mountains on Earth, it's always been difficult to travel between them and, consequently, they're each sort of their own little world inside of Afghanistan. Over thousands of years, they each ended up developing their own rather distinctive cultures, identities, beliefs, tribes, and rulers, and thus, there's very little sense of Afghan nationhood and and Afghan patriotism has never been a particularly strong motivating factor. Because of all these separate and rural communities that are difficult to travel between, the grip of any central government has always been weak and intermittent while the valleys have largely governed themselves autonomously, especially in the countryside. Any semblance of Afghan national unity has always been a direct consequence of foreign powers invading and attempting to impose their rule over the whole, like with the British, Soviets, and recently Americans. Historically, and up to the present day to an extent, Afghanistan continues to operate in a way that's more similar to the Holy Roman Empire than the European Union. The ruler oh and the no, I keep meaning to, every single time I, that comes up, the Holy Roman Empire, I keep forgetting, like, I have to watch a video on that. Okay, I'm gonna try and do that this week. I'm gonna try and watch a video on the Holy Roman Empire. 
I get, I kind of understand uh, what he's saying though, because I've had enough references to it in the past and a lot of you guys in the comments have explained it to me a little bit. So I very, I kind of like understand the concept of it. I, I had heard, like I said, in my research, I'd heard that Afghanistan was very tribal and did not have that kind of national identity and that it was kind of hoisted upon them by the, the Western you know, nations. And I didn't know though that that was primarily because of geography and I guess maybe a little bit of like language and, and culture too, but, or maybe the language and the culture is a result of the geography, you know? Like he said, the cultures developed kind of differently because they were so isolated from each other. I didn't realize that Afghanistan was this mountainous and um, yeah, it really does like remind me a lot of California. Like those pictures they're showing with the villages and then the mountains in the background. A lot of uh, cities and towns look like that in California. So it's really interesting how uh, geography can look so similar in different parts of the world, which maybe, you know, makes sense because it's we're all on the same planet, but you know. To the present day, to an extent, Afghanistan continues to operate in a way that's more similar to the Holy Roman Empire than the European Union. The ruler in the capital city, Kabul, may nominally wield de jure authority over the entire realm, like the Holy Roman Emperor, but is not able to wield de facto authority over all of the various princes, valleys, tribes, and clans, just like the Holy Roman Emperor. Any invader coming in to occupy Afghanistan will struggle with all of the same issues that a domestic ruler will. Afghanistan's geography is not very conducive to a centralized authority, and neither is Afghanistan's infrastructure. Enforcing your authority across the various <laughs> Afghan valleys means that you must move your troops and supplies from one to another through the various mountain passes that are often narrow and incredibly easy positions to set up an ambush in as a defender. These passes basically act like natural choke points for the movement of people all across Afghanistan and, up until the 1960s, there were hardly even any roads to speak of that went through them. Control over just a few of these mountain passes can ensure control over an entire valley, and sabotaging one can block the flow of supplies and troops for days, weeks, or even longer depending upon the severity of the damage. When the wow. Soviets invaded the country, the Mujahideen defenders would ambush Soviet convoys as they traveled through these passes, and then immediately flee back and vanish into the caves of the mountains when they were fired back upon. They would set up roadblocks at river crossings or in other passes, and in some instances were successful enough to block entire roads for months or even years. The town of Khost near the Pakistan border was permanently sealed off from the rest of the country for the entire war by the Mujahideen sabotaging a series of strategic roads, and the government forces blocked inside could only be supplied by air. And when the Americans invaded, these passes were just as vital. Most significant for them was the Khyber Pass here, the easiest and most direct path through the Hindu Kush between the Indian subcontinent and Central Asia. This path has been used for thousands of years by conquerors, traders, and missionaries all alike, and is without a doubt one of the most strategic locations to hold on the entire planet. At one point, nearly 80% of all NATO and US supplies that were being brought into Afghanistan by road were all coming through the Khyber Pass via Pakistan, which wow. is kind of ironic because most of the Taliban's equipment were also coming from across the border in Pakistan, just at different and more rural crossing points. The Taliban knew how critically important the Khyber Pass was to the American war effort, so it was a frequent target of sabotage efforts. In 2009, the Taliban blew up a bridge here that temporarily shut down the entire pass, and America was forced to broaden their supply lines into Afghanistan through the three Central Asian bordering countries as well. In the years before all of this war, the Afghan government had attempted to build a circular highway that would connect all of their major economic centers together. But over the decades of civil war and Soviet intervention, the highway was in very bad shape. By the time the United States invaded in 2001, there were only a mere 50 kilometers of paved roads to speak of in the entire country that's bigger than France. For comparison, France has 1.1 million kilometers of paved roads in a smaller and significantly less mountainous territory. Oh, the pretty... lack of good roads only made the disparate valleys and communities of the Afghan interior even more isolated from each other, and it made transporting troops and supplies a logistical nightmare for the Americans. Okay. And the... 
So also in some of my research, I, I heard that we, you know, apparently the United States invested like $2 trillion into Afghanistan. Now, I know that some of it went to like, in, supposedly went to infrastructure. And now I don't know if, you know, I've, I've also a lot of people were saying that, you know, the, there's a lot of corruption and that probably a lot of the funding never really got to the actual destination. And I don't know. I don't really know anything about it. It's a big mess, it seems like. But um, if we now I understand what what they meant by infrastructure. Um, I didn't realize that it was that bad there. So yeah, just like building roads, I can understand why the the U.S. would want to at least invest in paving some roads or something. And the Soviets before them, none of which helped at all for the country's stability. As with all things in Afghanistan, the development of new roads is difficult and expensive because of the harsh mountainous terrain, the cold winter weather that often chews roads up, and sabotage from the Taliban and other insurgents. Building or repairing roads in the country necessitates hiring security and necessitates building them across harsh geography and climates, which means that it can get incredibly expensive, as much as $5 million per mile in some locations. And this is all in a country where the average person only makes a little over $500 a year, one of the poorest and least developed nations on the planet. The construction of a single mile of road within Afghanistan is about the combined annual wages of 9,800 Afghanis. So, obviously, the funding for all of these projects has to come from abroad. Ultimately, Afghanistan is easy to invade and take over, but it's almost impossible to effectively hold it for long. The landscape is huge, with a lot of rural and empty places for insurgents and rebels to hide. Getting troops in and establishing supply lines through massive mountains and narrow passes is challenging and easy for guerrilla combatants to harass and disrupt. The relationship with neighboring Pakistan is complex, and Pashtun insurgents can easily cross the border and regroup without much fear, and then return to fight in Afghanistan whenever ready. The flow of insurgent supplies, money, and manpower across the border is difficult to stop through the hundreds of high and remote mountain passes, and requires the cooperation of Pakistan, which she is sometimes willing to give, and other times not. Centralized rule is almost impossible to enforce outside of Kabul by way of Afghanistan's geographic reality, and a nation building is inherently impossible because even the concept of an Afghan nation among Afghanistan's various ethnicities and tribes is tenuous at best, and certainly radically different from the Western idea of nation states such as Germany or France. The colonial era borders of Afghanistan dictated by the British over a century ago are probably the biggest core reason for Afghanistan's instability. Stability, but Afghanistan has been particularly unstable even by former British colonial meddling standards. For the past 43 years, Afghanistan has been embroiled in constant warfare, and it's an incredibly complex story to tell. From a communist revolution that enforced state atheism in one of the most conservative and religious countries on the planet, to an invasion and occupation by the Soviet Union, three subsequent civil wars, and then the invasion of the Americans and NATO, and the United States occupation that's all set to finally end after nearly 20 years in about a month from now. It is one of the most fascinating, violent, and controversial conflicts of both the 20th and 21st centuries, and unfortunately, not acceptable for me to cover on YouTube due to their terms of service. I know how making oh, videos man. on YouTube works, and I know that this video already has a super high chance of being demonetized and unpromoted by YouTube's algorithm because of what I'm discussing. But the moment that I really start diving into the whole history of the Afghan conflicts, why they began, how they were fought, and how it all led to where we are today, it's a guarantee that this video will be censored and you won't get to see it. All right, well, uh, that was kind of disappointing. I was hoping that we would get a little bit more into the history of it, but I, I do appreciate all of the explanations of the borders and the logistical issues that, you know, arise when you try to go into Afghanistan. It does help me understand the situation a lot more, I feel like, but yeah, I am lacking a little bit more of that historical context, so I think I'm going to have to explore around a little bit more either on YouTube or find some other resources online to learn a little bit more about this. I would really like to know more about like the British and the Russians time there and kind of what happened and just I like, would like to learn more about just the history of Afghanistan in general because I 
feel like, you know, you need to know that in order to understand the British and the Russians being there and ultimately the Americans as well. But I did learn a lot. I'd learned a lot about the geography there. I learned just how mountainous Afghanistan is. I learned where Kabul is. I actually thought Kabul was on the other side of the uh, country. Also, it was really interesting to see that planned uh, highway that they had going around the country that would have connected a lot of the, it looks like, passes into the country. And, and it would have allowed travel to be a lot easier, it looks like. But but as he's pointed out, there would be a lot of issues with just building it. So I don't know. It kind of seems like Afghanistan might be just one of those places on, on the planet where it's just not going to be really possible to, you know, build up that infrastructure and stuff without a lot more stability, I guess, in the country. And maybe Afghanistan doesn't need to even be a country. You know, maybe it needs to kind of like be divided up in a way that makes more sense for the people that live there. Again, I don't know what the reason was for the borders as they are today. It's definitely something that I want to learn more about. If you guys have any videos that you could suggest for me down below, I would appreciate it. Also, if you have anything to add down in the comments, please do. But like I said, please keep it respectful. Let's try to refrain from getting into any sort of like political fights or discussions. I'm way more interested in just like the history of this rather than political attacks. I have to say also it's really really interesting to me that did we know about all of this regarding Afghanistan in 2001 when the US went in or for that matter when the Russians went in in the 1970s I think it was because if we had this understanding of how Afghanistan actually worked I feel like we probably wouldn't have tried to do all of this stuff you know at least that seems to be the more sensible thing to do is just to not try to enforce like this whole nation state thing on the people there because it's not gonna work. I don't know, it's a big mess. It is one of those things where maybe there's just no real good option. Maybe there are certain things that you just have to do that you know aren't gonna turn out super well but you still have to do them. You know, I don't know if it's like more of that type of thing but that's the thing with like uh, history and you know things that happen is very gray usually. There's no like black and white to most situations I feel like in the world. Yeah, so thanks guys for watching. If you enjoyed this video or you enjoy my videos in general, I appreciate it if you would like and subscribe. Roger here and I, thank you guys for watching as always and we will see you next time.